Okay, right. Let's bring up the volume up a little bit. There we go. I hope you can hear me all right. Uh, welcome to episode five of Teacher Talking Time. Um, so welcome. Um, here we are. And thank you. I can see a few people have arrived. Uh, and Eric is here. So nice to see Eric. And let me go over here. And let's see. Hopefully the pop-up works. Yeah, and the lovely elevator music returns. So thank you ever so much, everybody, for tuning in today. And uh, hopefully, let me just control my microphone a little bit. It's a bit loud. Don't want it to pop. Um, so <laughs> um, <clears throat> thank you ever so much for everybody uh, tuning in. And as always, uh, please feel free to um, post your questions in the chat. Um, it would be great to answer any questions that you may have and today is a special day because um, tomorrow is uh, my birthday um, and uh, so today is going to be like a sort of special birthday sort of whatever and uh, any uh, tips or uh, teaching questions that you may have or anything then please feel free to do so or if you have any questions about myself or you know what I'm planning to do for my birthday then please feel free to put in the uh, comments and I'll answer any questions that you may have. So um, today we're going to be having a look at some pronunciation activities and how I deal with pronunciation in the classroom. I'm also going to be looking at how um, I teach it in an online environment, how to teach the um, pronunciation or cover pronunciation as well. I'm also going to be looking at um, some blog posts, uh, so a few posts and a few bloggers or websites. And then um, on top of that, I'm going to be looking at uh, recent news um, and events in the EFL industry and then finally I do have my special book here of poems and so today uh, at the end we'll have a look at uh, this poetry book so hopefully you can see that and I'll choose I've already chosen a poem for today so we'll have a look at that um, and Amal is here thank you Amal for your lovely comment I hope you a happy and prosperous years ahead. Thank you ever so much, Mal. Um, yeah, fingers crossed. Um, it's already November. Um, it's getting a bit chilly. Um, I should have put a jumper on because I'm a bit a bit cold. Um, <clears throat> but uh, hopefully I'll be able to have a, a prosperous year ahead. Um, obviously, the pandemic has caused um, a few issues in terms of uh, people losing their um, livelihoods and their incomes. And But fortunately, I have a job that I am passionate about and that I love. Um, anyway, uh, thank you ever so much, Amal, for your kind uh, message. Um, so um, let's get started and what I wanted to do um, is to have a look at how I teach the phonemic chart and um, I'm going to have a look into my dive into my lesson material particularly remote okay and what I do with regards to um, uh, teaching pronunciation or how I incorporate it in my lessons and obviously when it comes down to pronunciation and teaching pronunciation or developing learner awareness of uh, pronunciation, English pronunciation, then there's a variety of things that you can do in the classroom. The, um, okay, let's have a look and share my website. And as you can see, not my website, but my um, uh, uh, page on my browser, as you can see here, we have um, under my Google Drive, I've got uh, lesson material um, and pronunciation activities. And, you know, if I go um, a little bit further back, I've got like a grammar review, IELTS material, lesson topics. Um, and under lesson topics, I've got a variety of different topics that I include and I start adding towards um, when it comes down to uh, my teaching but one thing that I always use is um, uh, some material um, or some 
resources that I have um, adopted or borrowed. Um, and, uh, and one thing that I like to try and incorporate before I start teaching pronunciation is the idea of the phonemic chart. And I, I normally go through the pronunciation and the phonemic chart. And if you're not too sure of the phonemic chart, um, there is an online interactive phonemic chart. I, I like this. Um, and as you can see here, once it loads up on English Club, um, you have a variety of um, the sounds, all the sounds used in British English uh, speech. Um, and you have examples in highlighted um, with the E sound. So when it comes down to the phonemic chart, I tend to introduce and share this website with my students. And I go through initially the vowel sounds. And if the students know what the vowel sounds are, they know what the diphthongs are because diphthongs are two vowel sounds combined together. That, that's basically it. Um, and one activity that I use to introduce the vowel sounds is um, uh, a, a very simple um, listening activity for the students. So I say to the students, you're going to listen to 10 words. I'm going to read out 10 words and I just want you to write the words. Don't worry about the spelling, just focus on the word and then write it down in a notebook or, you know, pen and paper. And uh, then we'll go through the words together. And essentially, if I go back to um, here, if I just open up a new Google document, the 10 words that I um, ask the students to write down, and I always start at zero. So I say, okay, we're gonna start at zero. OK, and I say, have a listen, just read, oh, sorry, write down the word that you hear. And the first word would be bit. The second word would be beat. And then the number two would be uh, bit, beat, bet. Um, and we go on and on. Uh, number four would be bit, beat, bet, but, boot. Bit, beat, bet, but, boot. Number five, uh, bought. Number six, bit, beat, bet, but, boot, bought. I'm missing a few. Bit, beat, bet, but, boot, bought, bite, bait boat. I might as well type it out and then figure out what I'm missing. Bite, bait, boat. Right. Hmm. Okay. I need to go back to my phonemic chart and work out. Oh, it's the, is it the S sound? Yeah. Bit, beat, bet, but, boot. <laughs> oh. Bit, beat. So we got the E, the I bit, beat, bet. Oh, bat. That's what I'm missing. The A sound. Bit, beat, bet, bat. Anyway, you get the idea. So... Um, we end up having bat, etc. And um, let me re-number these. And so we have 10 words. Um, <laughs> we'll get there in the end. Um, and so in, in this form here, um, we have the 10 words. And I say, okay, to the, you know, to the student I'm teaching, let me just increase the size a bit. I tend to go, okay, so this sound here is a, I sound, yeah? 
here. Um, and then we go, okay, so what's this sound here? And, you know, I, I say it's combined with three sounds, the B, E, and T together. So beat, um, etc., etc. So I go through the, the f three sounds in each word and I introduce them to um, most of the vowel sounds on the phonemic chart. Once I've got to the point where I'm uh, confident that the student is aware of each of the sounds, I say to the students, right, uh, I'm going to tell you a telephone number, but instead of using the number, I'm going to use the word. So they have to really tune in and hear the, that particular vowel sound. So, for example, you know, if you have uh, the telephone number of the da, 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 something like this. Don't call that number. It's just one that's random. Um, <laughs> um, so here I, I just write down a random number and I say to the students, have a listen and I'm going to tell you the word and you have to write down the corresponding number. And we go through it like this. So, you know, bit, bite, bat, boot, but, etc, etc, etc. And what they have to do is write down the number and then we compare. Have they got it right? Have they got it differently? Oh, you can't see that at the moment, but there. So we, we have that number and um, they compare their number with the number that I wrote down and what I said. And I said, OK, that that's good. Are there any differences and what are the differences and um, what's the best way to focus in? And it really helps uh, dive into the certain aspects of pronunciation, certain vowel sounds that um, maybe the student is um, having issues with. And so you can focus in on those particular sounds when it comes down to the phonemic chart, if you get my meaning. <laughs> yeah. Um, and once the vowel sounds have been introduced, um, I say, well, the diphthongs, three of which are included at the end of this activity. Um, I say the diphthongs are very simple. It's very easy. It's just two vowel sounds combined together and you've got it um, pretty quick to learn then. Um, so the vowel sounds look a bit strange, but then I go, but, you know, we, we've got to know 10 of the sounds out of the 12. OK. Um, now, when it comes down to the consonants, when I introduce the consonants, um, I say, well, actually, the sounds um, and the letters that you can see, which are very familiar for you, are very simple. Yeah. So the, the top one would be a p, p and a f and a t. Yeah. And we go along. And I say, well, don't worry about these at the moment and these and this, these five and this one and this one and this one are a bit more complicated, but the principle's the same. Out of all the consonants here, there's probably about seven or eight that the student won't know what it is. And I say, don't worry about those. The vast majority you know already. So the student is aware of the different sounds, most of the sounds by now. And then I go, OK, let's have a look at this one. And it looks like a mathematical symbol or something like that. Um, and it's a th, yeah, th, th. And this one is a slightly unvoiced, like a th, th, this, this, this. It's not really voiced. Uh, um, it's not as loud as this one. So, you know, think and this, slightly different. This one, I say, OK, well, it's very similar to the shh, yeah, the shh, be quiet, or the shh, shall, or um, should, so the shh sound. And I go, well, it's very similar, but you put a T before it, so it's like a ch, ch. Very, very natural. Um, And by the end of it, after about an hour, the student has got to know the different sounds 
within the phonemic chart. And um, when I first started teaching the phonemic chart, I felt very uncomfortable with it. I didn't have the confidence to know exactly what symbols represented which sounds. And it was only through a case of getting to know the phonemic chart myself that I could use it in the classroom. And I've used it with a variety of ages. Um, young learners, teenagers, adults, they all pick it up very quickly. Um, and it certainly does help when it comes down to pronunciation and intelligibility, because that's what we're striving towards, that focus on trying to achieve intelligibility. So whether you speak uh, French or Spanish or Korean or, uh, you know, Mandarin, if listeners, if native speakers can understand what you're saying, then you've achieved the goal of intelligibility. But sometimes when it comes down to learners or speakers of other languages, they have difficulties or, you know, listeners have difficulties understanding what someone is saying. And it's not just um, non-native speakers. It can happen to native speakers as well. Um, so, you know, if I go up to Scotland, um, I, I remember um, going on to uh, um, uh, going up to Newcastle um, to see my grandmother. My grandmother was from Newcastle. And so she was a Geordie, what we call a Geordie. And, you know, they have this very strange accent going, why, man? And that sort of thing, you know. Um, and if you're not used to the accent, then it can be quite um, daunting. And I remember asking someone in Newcastle, oh, is this the bus stop to get to, um, you know, uh, Gateshead? And the chap said, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, whoa. And I just kind of smiled and nodded as like any learner would and <laughs> carried on <laughs> and said thank you. Um, right now, um, so when it comes down to the phonemic chart, you're just driving towards um, intelligibility and uh, that that's the key aim and that's one thing. Now, um, interesting question we got from Amal, uh, so just bear with me. So Amal says, excuse me, sir, I'm looking for ways to teach my low achievers in English. I'm doing online classes using Zoom. Um, interesting question. Thank you ever so much. Um, Appreciate the question here. So when it comes down to um, low levels, I won't say low achievers, but low level learners of English, you have to be absolutely patient with them. You know, you can't um, expect huge leaps or huge improvements within a lesson. You have to go step by step and you have to model a lot for the, the learners to actually incorporate. Um, so you model your scaffold. Um, so for example, um, if I go to my uh, page here, and let's go down a little bit. Let's see, can you see that okay? It looks like you can. Okay, so for example, like a student introduction, okay. And assuming they know the alphabet, assuming they can read, um, but they can't really communicate yet or they can't write much, we need to start from the bare basics uh, when it comes down to low level learners. Um, so, for example, you could say my name is and then have a gap. And I am from and then have a gap. Uh, my hobbies are and then you have a gap and essentially what they do is they learn the structure very simple but they fill in the gaps and they personalize it with the information that they think is suitable for them you know and th this is very simple very controlled and then you could go okay well the, ne uh, the following lesson I'm gonna take this um, and you say my and then you start to add in more gaps and I am let's say put it here and my so then it allows the learner to try and memorize and remember what what they've looked at uh, before and you can't see that bear with me let's go down 
Um, okay, so here we are. So you can see um, the first one has some of the gaps in. The second one has even more gaps. And then the final one, you know, after uh, a couple of lessons and after a, a review with them, they end up with uh, complete gaps. Okay. And, and so you give them um, more and more control over basically something very simple, very modeled with a bit more creativity. And then finally, they have to try and use the language that they can remember um, by creating the sentence. And that's one way that you could use um, the uh, um, use their ability to their advantage. And um, as a learner, they'll actually feel a lot more um, uh, engaged and uh, feel a sense of achievement saying, well, actually, I can write in English. I never knew that. Um, but it also requires, um, you know, uh, another thing when you're teaching low levels or low, low achievers, as you put here, um, is to uh, have that patience with them. If you're patient with the students, then they're going to be doing very, very well. Um, and you give them credit. You say, well done. You've done extremely well here. That's fantastic. Um, here, we just need to change this a little bit or improve that part of it. Um, so when it comes down to uh, low levels, that's what I would recommend. But that that's the writing. That's the element of writing, first of all. When it comes down to um, speaking, then that's where it requires a lot of support. And you need to try and encourage the learners to take that, um, uh, what would we say, uh, they have to try and make mistakes. You have to say, well, actually, if you're going to be communicating and speaking in English, well done. You've already decided. That's great. But like anything in life, you need to make lots of mistakes before you start to, um, you know, develop and improve. And, and the students need to know that making mistakes is part of the learning process. And I, I give them the, um, I, I think I mentioned it in previous uh, live streams where I give the analogy of swimming. Um, and, you know, you could study the aspects of swimming and the dynamics and, you know, the certain elements of the body and how it moves and the best way and the quickest way to swim up and down the pool. Um, but when it comes to actually swimming, then that's where things start to, um, you know, you you won't be able to swim if you, all you've done is read how to swim, but you've not actually done it. You need to train your body. You need to train your muscles and your, your um, uh, you know, various uh, uh, elements of your body of move in and adjust in and get in that that um, muscle memory working and it's the same with communication in 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 english and i i've taught students from you know particularly in south korea where they were very hesitant they didn't want to make a mistake they've studied grammar and vocabulary so much but when it comes down to communicating they're very reticent they're very quiet they don't want to talk because they're they're they have this um uh, idea that a mistake is bad, but actually mistakes are good and we all learn from them. And it's really important for students to know that a mistake is there to help you achieve better. Um, you know, so I say, well, um, when I speak in Korean, I'm going to make loads of mistakes. Some of the time it will be um, minor. As long as people can understand what I'm trying to say, that's fine. Um, and I say, look, I, I don't mind. I, I make mistakes all the time. And the same for your English. If you're going to be communicating in English, make the mistakes. 
try and make them as many as possible and try to re reflect and remember from those mistakes saying next time I won't say it like this or uh, I mispronounced it like that or mm, I, I said the wrong word or I, I didn't use the correct grammar form and that sort of thing. Anyway, so that's, um, <clears throat> excuse me, anyway, so that's uh, one idea, Amal, when it comes down to teaching low levels, giving that guidance, giving them that support, being patient, modeling everything for them and encouraging them to take that risk, to take that communication, to take that speaking um, and to say, here in this classroom, you make the mistakes. When you go out, you try and if you make mistakes again, that's fine. You can tell me about it, you can reflect on it as long as everything's good. Right, now, um, I hope that kind of answers your question, Amal. Um, so, um, we'll move on. Now, um, let's go back to our main website. So here, thank you ever so much, Amal. Um, I hope this gave you some ideas of what to do when it came down to student introductions. Um, anyway, bum, bum, bum. Let's remove that. So um, uh, when it comes down to pronunciation, I go through this activity, as I've mentioned already. I give them the telephone number. They have to listen to the word and write down the corresponding number. And then there's another pronunciation activity. So once the students have um, become more comfortable and confident with the use of the uh, um, phonemic chart, um, I then look at this two aspects, connected speech and English pronunciation. I tend to go for the connected speech. And as you can see, um, and again, this is adapted from one book that I thoroughly enjoy and you can see the phonemic script here um, and so I say okay well let, let's have a look at the first word and um, we'll zoom in a little bit and you can see here it's a teacher teacher okay and with connected speech there's going to be two um, words okay so there's 10 sounds um, but down below there are 20 gaps. Um, and so I say to the students, okay, um, have a look at the sentence and have a think, okay, so did you have to wait, whatever that is, a long time? And how do you spell it? Well, you spell it like a long time. And the other word would be a long and that sort of thing. So um, uh, we're looking at, uh, I think it's called homophones where two words sound the same but uh, have two different meanings and a, another example like uh, teacher and teach a yeah so um, the same sound but two different meanings um, and so that that's what I look at with connected speech and then finally the stress patterns and one thing that I like to focus on is stress patterns because it really helps the learners um, understand uh, how words are, are stressed, you know, certain words or certain syllables are stressed within a word. And here we have a stress on the second syllable from the end. Um, so like this, or stress on the third syllable from the end. And I'll put that down here like that. So for example, we have this word archaeology. And so I go, right, okay, archaeology, if I can spell it correctly, archaeology, yeah? So we got, uh, 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 uh. <clears throat> so yeah, um, it kind of goes in the third syllable from the end, and uh, the students go, ah, oh, okay, I get it. So, and then I go, go ahead, try and put the correct words in the box in uh, the table below. Um, so uh, allergic. Yeah, and they have to try and understand how the stress patterns work within um, within each of the, the syllables and uh, um, uh, do that uh, side of things. So I, I find it quite a useful activity and the students seem to enjoy this task and it just makes pronunciation 
um, much more accessible. Um, because, you know, when I talk about pronunciation, it's not just the phonemic script, which is, you know, the phonemic chart here. Um, it's much more than that. It's, you know, it's the sounds. It's how how uh, sounds can combine together and how things can be connected, connected speech. And, you know, um, <coughs> uh, there's... Um, uh, st stress in words and stress in sentences and you know when it comes down to the stress in a sentence you could say um, I bought a red jumper I bought a red jumper not a blue one or I bought a red jumper not a red t-shirt or a red um, you know red trousers I which would be weird because uh, I, I, I don't know um, uh, red <laughs> red uh, trousers will be a bit too rare. But yeah, you, you get my meaning. So there's certain um, words which are stressed within a sentence which can affect the whole entire me difference in meaning. And it's just getting learners aware of it because when they go into the real world, when they get out of their classroom and they speak to um, English speakers, they're, they're going to come across this and they go, well, you know, and it has a direct effect when it comes down to listening and how how um, learners can hear um, the the elements of pronunciation. They can pick up how things are blended and connected when it comes down to uh, natural, more um, fluent uh, speaking. And it helps them become more, more fluent as well. Um, so um, that, that's how I looked at pronunciation. And if you've got any questions about pronunciation, please feel free to um, uh, send, a, you know, ask a question. If you're not sure about pronunciation, just let me know. That would be great. And I'll be happy to um, answer your questions. Right. Um, I'm going to have a look at um, uh, a blog post um, and... Uh, Let's see. Mm -mm -mm -mm. I'm currently looking at, if I just share this, so I'm just looking at some of the blog posts that have come up. Um, oh, the soul of soul. Um, the best Korean ramyun and where to get it. Um, yeah, that, that's interesting. Um, I noticed Pete had a, a book review, um, so that, that was great. Um, uh, he had a book review about history's mysteries um, from Alphabet Publishing. Um, so um, let's have a quick look, see how Pete's done with his... Uh, and let's just zoom in. Um, you can see that all right. So uh, he talks about Uh, History's Mysteries, the book itself, uh, the material, he includes some of the material, um, quite a well written uh, review, um, quite extensive to be honest as a, re a book review, um, and ELT planning rating 4.7 out of 5, mm, very good, I'm going to like this post Pete, thank you so much, um, and yeah, good, right, but um, I wanted to have a look at some other um, blog posts um, and one thing that is quite common um, for English language teachers is to get involved with relation to culture um, and I can see this um, uh, person has written about terms related to culture um, <clears throat> now one of the elements about being an English language teacher is understanding the differences and the similarities of culture. Um, and this blog post here um, talks about um, the definition of culture. And uh, so this person mentioned culture is the beliefs, values and practices people learn in a specific context or society. So what one thing could be considered normal or suitable or appropriate within one society could be completely the opposite in another society yeah um, and <clears throat> uh, the, the biggest one here is that uh, you've got the um, uh, 
aspect of face. Um, so face, um, we, we have an element of face in the UK. You don't want to embarrass a host when it's their dinner party or, you know, you don't want to say the wrong thing because it could embarrass them and embarrass you. But it's even more so in Southeast Asia. So essentially, um, this element of face um, um, can cause quite a few differences or, you know, quite a few questions could be raised. And it's very important for English language teachers when they travel to a new culture, to a new country, to be aware of what that culture is. OK, um, and to be aware of how best to uh, carry yourself in that culture, in that country. Um, and uh, it, it's um, important to be aware of your own culture and what would be accepted in your culture might not necessarily be accepted in another culture. So, for example, I, I remember um, uh, working in South Korea and uh, uh, I, at that time, I was um, in the process of negotiating along with the other teachers there, um, the sort of um, aspects of uh, trying to become an examiner and negotiating how much um, I should be remunerated for the exam work. And it was um, Bulat's, uh, the Business Language Testing System it was called um, and so this exam by Cambridge um, was just being introduced into Korea I was very fortunate to be involved with the uh, exam training um, so I was involved you know becoming an examiner um, and it was a oral exam it was face to face a speaking exam um, and it got to the point where it was like, well, how much am I going to get paid? And the, the company I was working with was not too sure. And um, anyway, I'll, I'll get to my point about culture because I'm, I'm getting there. I'm just setting up the context at the moment. And sorry if, if I'm babbling on at the moment. But it got to the point where it was about money. And one thing that people don't like to talk about too much, but you have to, um, is money, particularly in Korea, where it's like, oh, yeah, but, mm, mm. but for me, I was like, right, OK, I need to get paid and I'm going to be as transparent as possible. And I'm going to include all the other examiners in an email to the management. And it kind of rubbed up the wrong way because I was too open, too transparent. And uh, one question was, why didn't he just send an email and not include everyone? And I was like, well, we're all trying to become an examiner. We're all here to try and help you, but we all need to know exactly how much we're going to get paid and remunerated for the exam work. Do we get paid per student, you know, um, uh, uh, per student or per candidate, or do we get paid per hour, or you know, or that that sort of thing? And these were things that we needed to talk about because, uh, and it was kind of. Uh, they didn't want to talk about, but in the end they did, and we, we, we accepted something. And, but if if you know which way is suitable or appropriate in one culture and not in another, then um, you're much more likely to be flexible and to accommodate that type of culture. Whereas if you're not sure and you make mistakes like I did when I first started in Korea, then... Um, then it's going to be uh, a bit more difficult for you. Um, yeah. Do you do you shake someone's hand or do you bow? And, you know, um, do you embrace someone when you say hello or you welcome them and you see them again? Do you hug them or, or not? Or do you have to have that physical distance? And um, I would recommend any language teachers, any anybody who's involved with traveling abroad to be um, just a bit more aware of culture and I, I thought this blog post here was f fascinating it, it went through um, fairly simple um, the basic elements of culture and there's an awful lot and you know I teach my students about uh, culture um, you know when it comes down to um, culture I try and get my students aware of what might be considered suitable for them in their 
country and when they come to the UK, like in an academic environment, might be unsuitable. So there's that element of culture. It's not about right or wrong, but it's about difference, I guess, and accommodating, you know, as a teacher, you accommodate, but for students, they have to accommodate as well. So it goes both ways. And so for some of my courses that I've taught, um, I've taught um, cross, what is it? Intercultural communication, how to communicate effectively between different cultures. And maybe in a future live stream, we could have a look a bit more detail about um, the differences, the elements of uh, culture, um, Hall's iceberg theory of culture, where everything you can see on the outside is um, uh, visible, but there's something hidden underneath below like an iceberg and and a lot of that is related to society and and that side of things um anyway so that that was one blog post that i'd recommend uh, people have a look at and uh yeah if it's something of interest um i'll put the link in the box here um so if it's of interest if you want to learn a little bit more about culture um and how it could affect you when it comes down to teaching then let me know um, I'll be happy to include it in a future live stream or something like that um, anyway um let's have a look uh, we've got uh, hardboard English um, so we have uh, here he is uh, hello from Vancouver Canada thank you hardboard English with teacher Paul um, thank you ever so much for joining uh, today's live stream really appreciate it um, it is um, meant to be a, a sort of celebratory live stream because it's my birthday tomorrow. There we go. Um, and you also um, mentioned you like what you're doing. Thank you ever so much, Paul. Um, yeah, really appreciate it. Um, and we've also got a nice comment from Amal again as well. So great. Thanks. I appreciate your effort. So thank you ever so much. And, uh, you know, I've already put the link in for the blog post as well. So you could have a look at that. Right. Let's have a look at one more blog post um, before we finish off. Um, and we're going to finish off today with a nice poem as well. Um, uh, yeah. OK. Now, one thing that I've seen with Eric, you know, etiquette teacher, uh, you know, English teacher, um, He's been asked quite a lot about classroom management. Um, and one thing that is quite common in the themes is um, how to manage the unmanageable, I guess. What would you do to manage a, a classroom in that respect? And how would you manage young learners? How would you manage teenagers? How would you manage adults? And they all come along with different priorities and uh, uh, difficulties. Whereas, you know, young, very young learners could have, uh, um, you know, a very short attention span. So you have to keep things going and, you know, from one task, another task, da, da, da. and even getting the kids from one side of the room to the front of the class for a story time or something like that requires a lot of staging. And, you know, I remember... Um, doing my young learner um, training um, after my, my CELTA course. I'd done a, a, tri a Trinity Young Learner Extension Certificate, which was great. I, I, re I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and this Young Learner Extension course um, was uh, really help helpful for me because I was never taught how to teach kids. I just picked it up as I went along but this time with this course it was like right okay you try this you try that and um, one thing that I learned was the staging of a classroom so like I mentioned moving students from one side of the classroom to another side of the classroom that was um, really um, uh, inspiring for me I thought wow I've never really thought about you know even staging you know the mini stages to get the students from one place to another um, particularly young really young learners and you know it got to the point where I would be staging okay everybody stand up very good now after five 
I would like you to put your ta chairs under the table. Very quiet. One, two, three, four, five. Boom. I done that and I said, very good. Now, shh, very quietly, you three students, you come here and sit down very good. And you three come very good and so on and so on. And then you basically um, stage it like that. And I was like, oh, wow, that, that's like, boom. I was blown away and I thought the feedback I got from this course, you know, during my initial teaching with young learners was um, uh, eye-opening. I, I really enjoyed the feedback that I got. Anyway, um, the final blog post that we're looking at is about four priorities for classroom management. And this blog post looks at um, uh, four <laughs> things. So sight, sound, and comfort. And yeah, the classroom should be neat, clean, and orderly in appearance. Um, if the classroom is messy, then it's going to be, uh, uh, you know, the students are going to react negatively or inappropriately. Um, blackboard should be erased and uh, organized. I, I would say, um, you know, the, the blackboards, whiteboards or, you know, interactive whiteboards should be organized. And maybe we can have a look at how to organize the, the whiteboard. That that would be a really good topic to look at later. Uh, chairs should be arranged, appropriately arranged. Uh, classroom should be as free from external noise as possible. So uh, a few points here um, worth considering. There's looking at si seating arrangements. Again, you know, you could sit the class as in um, a U-shape, a horseshoe. You could put them in rows. You could put them in uh, like small islands, small groups. Um, so there's that for, uh, considered um, uh, approach, yeah. And blackboard again, blackboard, whiteboard, interactive whiteboard. I I could go through this, um, but it's uh, quite in interesting that the um, uh, writer here looks at um, giving the visual inputs or you know. Uh, error correction on the whiteboard or you know there's certain ways to arrange your whiteboard so you've got like new language on the right grammar on the or the aims on the left and you've got the main vocabulary or the main work in the middle um, and then number four uh, teachers voice and body language so you know as a teacher all the students need to be able to hear you effectively um, Non-verbal messages are very powerful. <laughs> I I think um, for teachers that are um, you know teaching wherever they're from, um, let's uh, clear that. There we go. Um, right for teachers that are teaching, they have these um, non-verbal communication tools. You know, you could, um, I you know sometimes if. Uh, group of misbehaving I kind of mm, give them the eye or just stare at them and they go oh you know or if they're speaking in their first language I mm, I tend to write a message on a piece of paper and go yeah good well done English please and they go oh, oh, and they get, uh, they return back to English and it's these um non-verbal cues that you can give the students um, which are more powerful I think than actually saying something um, anyway right we've got um, 10 minutes remaining so any final questions um, please let me know in the comments um, again I've just shared the second blog post from uh, today um, so yeah any questions that you have please let me know please ask in the comments and I'll be happy to answer any questions or queries or um, you know that you you have um, anyway um, moving on um, we've got today what we went through um, pronunciation and how I go about teaching pronunciation We've looked at a couple of blog posts, which are great. Um, I'm going to be having my coffee in a moment. And that sort of thing. 
Um, right. So, um, finally, um, let's see what's happening in the news. Um, I'm not sure if you've seen it, um, but let's see. Um, in the news, the big one is uh, uh, Meta, Facebook changed into Meta. Um, but <laughs> as with any language, um, the uh, the new name for Facebook or, or the umbrella company um, um, has been ridiculed. Um, uh, because it, it's um, re it's related it, or it's been connected or you know it's similar to a word in Hebrew which means dead or or, or something like that. Um, so if we have a look here, I can see uh, Facebook's annou announcement for Meta um, is changing its name and it's caused quite a stir in Israel where the word sounds like the Hebrew word for dead. Okay, so. Um, quite interesting elements about languages and how um, things are, um, uh, are named um, because uh, there's um, other other things related to, to culture um, and when KFC arrived in China, very popular now in China, um, the motto finger licking good, it, you know, they tried to translate it and uh, in Mandarin it was eat your fingers off. <laughs> so quite quite a humorous um, uh, element of translation and always very important to try and um, to try and uh, accommodate uh, expressions or phrases. And sometimes um, certain um, phrases or, or uh, expressions, um, logos, um, you know, certain catchphrases that they have for a logo, uh, like uh, Audi, they've kept the German um, catchphrase, um, which I can't remember, but it, it's German, it's originally German, and they didn't bother translating it. Um, so, the, you know, like Nike, I think Nike was um, asked to come up with a, or they commissioned someone to um translate the logo just do it um and in in china uh, sorry in japan and the japanese um consultant who was there um was introduced to the the company the ethos of the company the idea of you just do it you you just run just exercise just do something and just do it that's nike that's the um, that's the philosophy behind Nike and it's like well how would you translate it into Japanese and you know the translator spent a month with Nike in America and then in Japan and he kept it the same he didn't even bother translating it he just kept it as just do it um, so sometimes these mottos these uh, catchphrases they don't need to be translated but when they do get translated, sometimes they get uh, <laughs> um, in a, a, a sticky situation. Um, another example was Rolls Royce. Uh, they changed the name of uh, its silver mist car um, because uh, I guess it translates mistranslates as excrement in, in German. So they have to be very cautious. Nokia released its Lumia uh, phone in 2011. Uh, Lumia is a synonym for prostitute although in particular dialects honda uh they had the name fitter the honda fitter um but they uh changed it they um it, um they changed the name um and i think it was changed to jazz um in most countries the honda jazz yeah so uh, quite an interesting news article for um today and now we've got five minutes remaining um so today's news there we are and we're going to finish off with a uh little bit of a poem and today's poem if i get it now today's poem is uh poems from our time um you know 1900 to 1942 um, particularly uh, important I era um, in the UK. Um, many young men were um, serving for their country and not returning back. Um, you know, they were um, uh, dying. Um, 
we had the First World War, the Second World War, and so now we're going to have a look at a poem. So have a remember, you know, have that in mind when we're um, looking at this poem, and you can see the the sadness, the uh, difficulties, and um, we we've got a poem um, in here, um, and it's in. 1918 to 1930s so and it's the aftermath the aftermath of the first world war okay now um this poem is hunger it's called hunger okay are you ready <laughs> i come among the people like a shadow i sit down by each man's side none sees me but they look on one another and know that I am there. My silence is like the silence of the tide that buries the playground of children. Like the deepening of frost in the slow night when birds are dead in the morning. Armies trample, invade, destroy with guns roaring from earth and air. I am more terrible than armies. I am more feared than cannon. Kings and chancellors give commands. I give no command to any. But I am listened to more than kings and more than passionate orators. I unswear words and undo deeds. Naked things know me. I am first and last to be felt of the living. I am hunger. So a very stark, a very dark and very um, powerful poem um, by Lawrence Binion. Um, so thank you ever so much. Uh, I hope you enjoyed or, you know, I hope it was an interesting poem. Um, so hunger. Um, what, what did he say? Uh, he, I am the first and last to be felt of the living hunger. Right. Um, so that's that. Um, are there any final questions before we finish off um, today's, well, episode five of this live stream? If not, I'll thank everybody else for tuning in, um, particularly a huge thanks to um, Amal, um, Eric for joining and Hardboard English with Teacher Paul. Thank you ever so much. Um, I will see everybody at the same time, one o'clock, uh, 1 p.m. UK time. The clocks have gone back, so, you know, um, just be aware that uh, the time of our live stream has gone back an hour as well. Um, whereas maybe in your country or in other countries, the clocks don't change. But anyway, that's it. Have a lovely, um, well, have a lovely week. Um, thanks for tuning in and I'll see you very much. Oh, and thank you for David. David popped in. Um, so thank you, David. Take care, stay safe and happy teaching. Bye bye.